from Visa. Jeff Allison joins us. First, some supporters to thank, and thank you for listening. This episode is supported by CCW Digital, leaders responsible for operations, information technology, contact centers, customer care, service, and support are invited to register for a free CCW Digital membership. Membership includes networking with 100,000 plus qualified industry professionals, quarterly executive research reports, product matchmaking, and more. Go to ccwdigital.com to join the community. This episode is also supported by the CCW Conference and Expo. The event will empower you to test, learn, and try the next big thing in customer experience optimization. Are you interested in mining data across touch points for personalized and predictive data? Are you trying to integrate your systems to get a more complete view of the customer? Are you figuring out what innovations to invest in? Chatbots, virtual assistants, AI, VR, biometrics, to name a few? Go to callcenterweek.com to register. The Senior Vice President of Global Merchant Support at Visa, Jeff Allison, joins us from CCW Fall and shares that he came to Visa through the acquisition of CyberSource. Visa, Jeff notes, is a surprisingly small company, which leads one to understand that it's actually a technology company. The value Visa saw in CyberSource was engagement and insight into the merchant realm. The disparate nature, then, of the merchants Jeff and his team service is stark, everything from the largest companies on earth to the smallest mom-and-pop shops. That makes threading the needle on customer management difficult, to say the least. The key is the data at the agent's fingertips. Welcome to CCW Digital on B2B IQ. I'm your host, Seth Adler. Download episodes on ccwdigital.com or through our app in iTunes within the iTunes podcast app in Google Play or wherever you currently get your podcasts. Jeff Allison. I am responsible for our global merchant support team. So much like customer support, um, my team works directly with merchants who are processing payments on the CyberSource or Authorize.net payment gateway. So we were acquired by Visa about eight years ago, and uh, we support about 500,000 merchants globally, ranging from the very small ma and pop shops, seasonal merchants, mini merchants, to the very large enterprise merchants that you would expect and see um, processing payments every day. So does that make you an original CyberSource guy? It does not make me original. I, I was, I've been with the, I've been with CyberSource about 11 years. Okay. And they're about 20-ish, they were found about 20 years ago. I see. All right. They, it. The thing. The thing. Well, uh, corporations are people too now. They are, so right. That's, so that's okay. Him or her, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so at CyberSource, when we were making this transition, right, into becoming a visa person. What were the immediate things that needed to change? Yes, yeah, so, you know, it was interesting because, I mean, CyberSource is a, was a very small company. I mean, we considered ourselves a startup. We had about, you know, seven to 800 employees. But I think the most surprising thing to me when we, was, when we came aboard at Visa is Visa is actually a very small company as well. I think at the time we came aboard, there was only, um, I think, 11,000 employees, and there's only 15,000 now. So, you know, it's definitely a technology company. That's what Visa is doing. Um, And so, you know, the the engagement and and the reason I think Visa saw the value of CyberSource is the engagement that it offered and the insight into the merchant realm which there was a little bit of that, but not a lot. All right. So we'll get to the merchants. Let's talk about the difference in cultures then, right? If we understand that CyberSource had something that Visa needed, Visa went out and got them and everybody was happy. Okay, great. We've got value to add here. What culture were you coming from? What culture were you entering? So the culture we were coming from was, again, more of a startup techie type organization. We were down in Mountain View, California, so right along you know, some of the the technology companies. The bus route. The bus route, yeah, yeah, right along there on the 101. Uh, So, you know, I think think going into it, it was interesting because it felt felt much more formal than what we were used to. Although the culture that we came into, I feel like has completely changed over the past three to four years. And I I associate that with our current CEO and our, our past CEO, 
who, again, focused on, you know, we're a, a technology company, not necessarily a financial service company. So um, I think the company that we're at today is, is the company that we would, that we align with very, very well. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss, essentially, Ex exactly. with a little bit of a hiccup in between right, kind right. of thing. But it's, it sounds like the acquisition was kind of towards that thinking anyway. I think so. All right, so let's talk about the merchants. You say everything from mom and pop to big, giant, giant companies. What through line is there, if there is one, between that mom and pop shop and, you know, Fortune One? Yeah, so I could I could talk for a long time about that. So our <laughs> our merchants, it's it's vast. It really is. Yeah. I mean, we have some merchants that may process two or three payments a month. Um, you know, we have a seasonal merchant who is crocheting Easter eggs just around the Easter holidays, and then that's it. We have um, merchants who are on Main Street and they're making caramel apples for their local community, suddenly they create a website and suddenly the entire, you know, literally the world has opened up to them. <laughs> and so if you're coming to our tour tomorrow, you're gonna see a, a kind of a case study on that specific merchant. So these are, you know, the small business merchants. Mm. And, you know, supporting them is very different than a, a large enterprise merchant where they're literally processing, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions a month. Mm -hmm. And they have teams that are responsible for payments. So, you know, when you get a call into our call center uh, with a small business merchant, you know, the questions are very different. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have a developer. I need to integrate. What's this error I'm getting? How do I add MasterCard? It's, it's those types of questions which, you know, our, our associates are helping. Yeah. The larger, you know, merchants, if they're calling in, it's, it's typically much more critical and... Uh, significant it's much more critical and significant right. but and i want to get to that but you are using as a case study this caramel apple uh, people amy's gourmet apples okay so why is this a case study and meaning yes maybe that's more critical but this is also important is my point right it's very, absolutely um you know and i think any merchant that we are supporting is important um, you know, this is their livelihood. This is their, in many cases, their dream. Mm -hmm. And um, and to see them, A, have this ability and give us the opportunity to help them be successful, help them um, expand, help them grow, it's it's very rewarding. And it's a very, it's it's a great kind of lifeline as you watch the, the progression of these merchants. And just dive in on Amy's just for a little bit. What, what folks... If folks already have the plane ticket, you know what aren't they going to see? So just share a little bit. Uh, oh, to, like the about Amy's. Yeah. Again, so Amy's is is very unique. They were they were just a brick and mortar store, uh, literally on Main Street in some small city, I think in Iowa. Um, and you know, using their grandmother's caramel recipe, you know, it's a, a very emotional connection, and. Again, they, they create this website and they're like, well, now we need to accept payments, you know, instead of in the brick and mortar on the website. So they integrated with authorized.net, which is simple and easy to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not as elaborate as, um, say, CyberSource, which is for an enterprise level merchant. So then again, now, and they talk about how exciting it was to get their first order that they had to fulfill from an order that came in over you know, online, and suddenly they're shipping to Florida and California and Canada and, uh, you know, something they just didn't expect when they first, you know, opened up the store. And it's rewarding to you to see that because you know that you're helping out in some small way. Obviously. It is, absolutely. Obviously, it's their business, but, you know, not going to be able to do that without you guys. Yes. Now let's talk about critical. Let's talk about Fortune One. When you say critical, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I think, you know... I, for us, when someone, when a merchant's calling, it's usually not to just say, you know, hey, how's it going? We're just checking in. And, <laughs> you know, it's usually something's wrong. Right. And um, the, the interesting thing about our large merchants who are, again, processing thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions 
is they know instantly when they're not, everyone here probably knows when you swipe your card in that moment where that's not transacting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough place to be in because A, we want to certainly notice when that is broken before the merchant, but the merchant notices instantly. So it's, it's, a, t it's a tough game. So again, usually when they're calling in, there's an incident or there is an escalation or mm -hmm. there's um, you know, some research that needs to be done. So our, our cyber source team, as well as our authorized.net team, it's a very technical um, oriented group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being able to dive in technically and understand what the issues are, escalate them properly and, and certainly resolve it. And there's a lot of internal escalation, so we work very close with our product team and our, our sales team, as you can imagine, eventually even our corporate communications and marketing team if, if there's large issues. Okay, so they're well informed and we've got connections all around so that uh, we've got the resources there. What kind of data are you feeding in to the contact center so they've got it at their fingertips? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, it, for example, you know, one of our teams is a fraud team, and, um, well, actually, that's a poor example. Um, <laughs> um, well, Biggest no, laughs coming, of course, from the visa table. No, it's not. It's, I'll, I'll talk about our fraud team and kind of some of the data that we feed our teams to support the merchants. So on CyberSource, um, as you're processing payments, CyberSource is known for its, its fraud detection um, system, which mm -hmm. is called Decision Manager. And anyone that's integrated with CyberSource, all of the transactions are going through this, this fraud detection um, system. And what happens within that system is we're able to look at um, components of all of the CyberSource and Visa transactions. So annually, that's like 68 billion transactions. So we can look at characteristics of that mm. and understand very specific details about fraud, whether that's happening regionally or within certain merchants and, or certain um, industries. Uh -huh. And so when these transactions go through, you know, we assist our merchants in determining if these are accepted or rejected. In many cases, we know instantly that needs to be rejected. Then we also work with the merchants one-on-one, -on -one, these large merchants, and we create a fraud uh, profile for them specifically. So they can actually say, well, rather than rejecting that, we're, we're okay with accepting the risk here, and we will accept that order. Or they could say, well, when a transaction's coming from Tallinn, Estonia, over you know, 200 US dollars, I want that one to be kind of looked at. Mm -hmm. So our fraud team will actually take those transactions that have kind of put in a pending state, and we will manually review them on behalf of the merchant and determine whether we accept it or reject it. Okay. Um, which is very cool. We, we do all, all sorts of you know, analytics and manual reviews on it. You know, for example, we may have someone that lives in Charlotte that is shipping something to Tennessee, and that's a red flag to this merchant. Mm -hmm. But when our, and when our review team looks at it, you know, we do it like an instant kind of Facebook lookup with their email, which we have. And we see that this person is actually stationed at the, at the naval base in Millington, Tennessee. So we can see, well, that's why they're shipping that there. We accept the order, and there's not, a, there's not revenue lost there for the right. merchant. So. This, this, in fact, makes sense, essentially. Yeah. So... I'm hearing exceptions, and I'm, I'm hearing that, obviously, there's a human element that needs to stay there because we need to check things. However, if you're talking about how many billions of transactions, uh, where are you with automation as far as what you can share with us today? What are you looking at, and how are you looking at it? Um, as far as transactions go? As far as anything. How are you automating anything? Within the call center? Indeed. You know, for example, the, you know, self-service, you know, it's big. We, we want our merchants to have the information that they want and need, you know, as fast as they can get it without calling into the center. So yeah. we're currently upgrading, um, you know, our, uh, you know, into a communities where we have the ability to offer a much more substantial self-service 
component that we have now. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at um, our knowledge management and always updating that so that they can, again, go there directly themselves rather than calling in. Mm -hmm. But again, we, we don't mind them calling in, but uh, you know, a lot of them do prefer to search that on their own. So again, we're wanting that to be as frictionless as possible. Give it to them if they want it. Frictionless, of course. Absolutely. So, so knowledge management community, as far as uh, solutions that you have looked at or decided on, not necessarily asking you what you've picked, but in that selection process, what's important? You know, what advice would you give colleagues who are looking at systems like this? Um, I mean, we have a great uh, group that help us, and that's Bryant's team, actually, that help us source it out, help us look at options um, that are involved in understanding, you know, what's the next great thing, and is that something we should consider? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the merchant organization is just a small part of Visa's customer support organization. So we have, um, I have some great peers that manage um, teams. So, you know, we also certainly want to look at, is there some opportunity to use this across all of our functions? And, and, and while we're still, um, siloed in some aspects, and I don't mean that negatively, it's just the nature of the systems a we use. A big business. corporation, no matter how many people work there, exactly. there's a lot going on yeah. that's going to happen. It is. Yeah. I even, yeah, it's... How uh, many years has Visa been in existence, for instance? Long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's more than four years. It is, is that more than four years. Well, it's more than 11 years, I guess, yes. since the CyberSource thing. All right, so that gets into, into you and... and uh, you know, you've been doing this for quite some time. You've just demonstrated that you know what you're talking about and that we would trust you with any contact center. Absolutely, thank you. Why is this? Where are you from originally? So I am originally from American Fork, Utah. Wait, you said? American Fork. American Fork, Utah. Yes. Where is this located? So American Fork is about 30 miles south of Salt Lake City. Uh -huh. You know, growing up there, we don't know why it's a fork. There's a Spanish fork about 30 miles south of us. Which does add up. Is there a connection there? I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> for you to really visualize American Fork, if, if anyone is familiar with the 80s, um, Footloose was filmed in American Forks. So. Ah. So. Literally filmed in American Forks. Literally filmed. I see. And yes. it could have been American Fork, right? It, it, it felt like it was written about American Fork. It was filmed yes. in the right place is what we're and saying. And I was Kevin Bacon's character. So. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and now we know. And it Here we go. Feels like the visa table knew before that. Well, let's get into that, though. I mean, you're growing up in American Fork, uh, Utah. I mean, you know, what were you into? What, were you into dancing? And, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe you know, wow. wanted to do that. And no. the, other, the other kids were cow tipping, I think, went on in that movie. I think there was some cow tipping, yeah. some tractor racing. Something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. I grew up on a farm, and... Uh, this is like very this is the personal, personal part. Okay. Yeah, the personal right. conversation about business. It was promised. So we had a big 40-acre farm, but my dad didn't like the animals being at the farm. He liked them in our backyard. So we had all of these animals in our backyard, like llamas and apacas and <laughs> Texas longhorns and peacocks and pigs and goats and geese and rabbits. So why was it that your father wanted them in the backyard? It's a great question, and we still ask him that. You okay. know, why? You know, we would be sitting here watching TV, and we'd see this llama walk by, and we knew our fence was down, <laughs> and it was just, it was embarrassing, and I call it child abuse. So. Fair enough. Uh, you are wincing when you say that there were, uh, you know, kind of animals in the backyard. I feel like you didn't take to the farm. Was I did not take to the farm. Yeah. I was much, no, I was, not a, I was not a farm boy, but that's what, you know, my father wanted a farm family, but we just weren't. But he didn't get a farm family. He did family. not get a farm family. Right. Okay. We were horrible at it. <laughs> right. So, so once we got into high school, the Jeff Allison oh, high school God. years, right? <laughs> what, uh, you know, what was it? What kind of informed you? What, where did you, what took you, you know? Was it kind of chess club? Was it mathematics? Was it 
like me, the theater? <laughs> wow, so I have coworkers here. This is like, yeah, this is a little embarrassing. So <laughs> I was in theater in high school. So was I. I've said I'm, I'm with you. That's Which what I'm is saying. why the farm thing didn't work out for right. me. Right, You know, exactly. my dad wanted me to haul hay, and I wanted to go watch Hello, Dolly. So. Or be... <laughs> That's pretty good. I was going to say, or be in Oklahoma. Right? <laughs> exactly, you know? right. So, fair enough. And did you, did you get parts in high school? I did, absolutely. What kind of parts did we get? Um, like um, James, Helen Keller's brother. Wow. Okay. In The Miracle Worker. It yeah. was you no know, intense. Uh huh. Yeah. Lots of musicals. Uh huh. Yeah. Do you have a voice you can sing? I don't, no. Yeah. I, <laughs> that was my issue as well. I was, I, the aforementioned Oklahoma, I was in that. Uh, as the traveling salesperson, Ali Hakim, only because he did not, role. he didn't sing though. He did, he, he can speak his song. Oh, he kind of chanted it. You're right. That's it. That's how I got that. And then uh, in the spring they did Evita and I had no part. Oh. Yeah. It's very sad. I mean, it sounds like you also realized that this wasn't going to be a career path, this whole no. theater thing, right? No. So what were you good at? If that's what you liked, what were you good at? What was I good at? You know, I... I've always enjoyed people, which is why the contact centers has always worked so well. And it's literally been my entire life has been in a call center. So um, when was the first that. job? So the first job was this horrible, horrible <laughs> place. It was in Provo, Utah, which um, is surprising when you hear what happened. But it was this it was this call center. It was an inbound call center where people would call to get guides to do online, uh, excuse me, to do auctions for cars. Okay. Like, get a car for $6. That was the marketing scheme. So these people would call in, and they would listen to this, you know, spill, and then we would break in and be like, hey, uh, do you want our guide for, you know, $69.95? When they're really selling them for, like, you know, $2. Right. And so anyway, I worked there, and then one day I showed up for work, and there was this big sign on it that says seized by FBI, and it's shut down because of these <laughs> questionable marketing things, and I was like, what is happening? So You were not questioned by the FBI. I was not. Right. Um, so that was a bad start, but after that, I um, went to um, Southwest Airlines. Okay. Before we get to Southwest, which is a unique brand and certainly was, I would imagine, the years that you were there, yes. specifically... Uh, did you pick anything up that you were able to bring to Southwest from this wacky place? Just like questionable marketing tactics, I think, yeah. You, you, but you didn't bring those faux, okay, fair enough. No, I, I, I'm I getting, literally brought nothing. I, fair enough. So you walk in fresh face to, to Southwest, and, and what years were these, roughly-ish? <laughs> wow. It would have been like 1990. Three. Which is the heyday of Southwest. This is Southwest it hits is. the scene big time. Well, actually, I worked, I, I started with Morris Air Service, which Southwest purchased okay. around that time, and that's how Southwest came into the Utah, Portland, Seattle, Boise market. Mm -hmm. What was the culture like there? At, at Morris Air? Well, or at once it became Southwest, once it was a. It was you know, super fun. I mean, yeah. it was literally like you hear about, and. You know, I think the one thing that Southwest has been true to is its history and its, um, you know, quest to, I mean, it's, I don't fly them anywhere anymore, but um, it's, it's stayed true to its name. Mm. How so? Like, well, just like they're fun and they, they push that and want you to have fun. And they, you know, back in, you know, before you even heard of empowerment, you know, we had empowerment, which, you know... Um, I, people appreciated and respected and responded to yeah. and wanted to, uh, you know, help customers because they knew they could. Yeah. Give us a sense of actually being on the front lines. I would imagine you were in the front lines at the contact center. Um, they were empowering you even unbeknownst to them, unbeknownst to you. But give us a sense of what was going on on the, you know, on the lines. What were customers asking about and how were agents helping? I mean, like, you know, you'd always get every now and then that, that call that would come in and they were calling, you know, 48 hours before the flight when the, typically the, the prices of an airline ticket is at the highest, but they were calling because it's, it's a bereavement. You know, they're going to a funeral for, you know, someone close and they're very distraught. And again, that was the empowering moment where we could actually offer reduced fares and things like that mm -hmm. and be very proactive about it. So... 
I mean, again, it was that type of environment, I think, you know, mm -hmm. really taking care of the customer above, you know, getting an extra $49 for the company. Right. I love that. They should tell American Airlines. They should. Um, I don't, that's a personal <laughs> one. Um, when was it that Southwest said, hey, Jeff, I think we can give you more stuff to do? You know, when, when was it that we popped you up into somewhat of a management role? So um, I moved from the front line into kind of their getaway packages where you started booking the airline tickets and the, the hotels and the cars, which I loved. It was very fun and learning all of the airline codes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was there about three years. Okay. So, I mean, I didn't go into management. I was in management at that point or anything like where that. Where did you go to? After that, I went to AT&T Universal Card. Okay. And? And it was, again, another great, empowering company that, again, put their customers first. And based it was where? Great. Where were you based? I was in Salt Lake City, but uh -huh. they're based in Florida. Okay. Um, and they've since moved all their call centers back to Florida. But, again, it was just... Um, and, you know, AT&T was even then just huge, but this, this Universal Card was a very tight-knit group, and um, we just had offices in Florida and Utah. Right. It was great. Fun times, it Fun sounds times, like. yeah. Right. A great call center environment, this beautiful building, yeah. very spacious and very, it was just great. I why, loved it. Why would you leave there? Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Who found you? Who found me? Yeah, who was the next uh, one After... on the ladder here? I need my resume. Where did I go after that? So after that, someone I, pull up his LinkedIn. <laughs> after that, I went to um, work for um, ACS, which has been acquired by Xerox now, which ah. was a outsourced vendor, and that's the first time I was managing um, accounts. Yeah. What I'm getting at, what I want to ask you about, is when you first started to manage people, you didn't know how to manage people, and how did you get through that first step? Yeah, I think, I mean, honestly, I got my first taste of that with AT&T. And I, I mean, even Southwest, and I think anybody that manages people think back to great managers that they had and mentors that they had. And I had some really good ones. And I think it was based on some of those supervisors and managers and directors that I had that kept my interest in the, the call center industry mm. to where, you know, I could see myself doing that and liking that and, you know, wanting to pursue that. What's the key to keeping someone's interest in the space? Um, in the call center space? Mm -hmm. You know, I think everyone just wants to, A, enjoy what they're doing, be respected. I mean, it's, it's just the basic fundamentals of life, really, to be challenged, mm. to um, have opportunity, uh, and that's, you know, as I look at what we do within Visa, we try to provide that. Um, we've just renovated our, our kind of a career pathing model for our frontline teams because, you know, we want them to understand there's so much opportunity for you, um, but sometimes they don't, they need to actually visually see that. And we purposely created this crazy career path map that has lines all over the place because it's truly, that's your opportunity right there. The question now is, where do you want to end up? Mm -hmm. We'll help you get there. Um, we'll help you, and you know, maybe it's two lateral moves and then two steps up, mm -hmm. but you know, there's a lot of opportunity. And you know, it's been well received by our, um, you know, our senior leadership team where now we're actually placing these roles in our Carl Center locations. So there is the opportunity to move up rather than you know, I've been in the call center for now for four years. I am out and need to find something else. We actually yeah. now have the opportunities there. If, how much is that, how much can you see that's helpful to uh, someone that is in the beginning of their career? Meaning, if you had had this university, this, you know, these tools at your fingertips way back in the day, how, how much would that have changed how quickly you could have risen? You know, I don't know if it would have, actually. You know, I like anyone that's generally moving up in a call center, I paid my dues. I, right. I know what it's like to be, you know, strapped to the desk for years. Um, and I enjoyed it, but, you know, you have to be able to... I mean, in order to move in because of your product knowledge, you have to gain the product knowledge. And right. I don't think there's anywhere better than to gain that within the support organization. Yeah. 
And you have to do it. You have to do right? it, absolutely. I appreciate the fact that you would like a promotion person, right. but you also, we also need you to know how to do what you're doing now. Well, exactly, you have to, yeah, you have to have that knowledge before you're really interested, you know, you can't go somewhere without that knowledge. So. That's it. Uh, is skill more important or is will more important? Hmm. You know, I think, I think will will get you the skill. Yeah. So, you know, I think skill is something you can learn, but if you don't have the will, it's, you're not going to get it. I, I appreciate you answering the question that way. And uh, moving forward, beware of binary questions. They're stupid. <laughs> so I have three... <laughs> I have three final questions for you. I'll tell you what they are, and I'll ask you them in order. What has most surprised you at work along the way? And we kind of just got a picture of work along the way. What's most surprised you in life and on the soundtrack of your life? One track, one song that's got to be on there. But first things first. Along the way here, what's most surprised you at work? At work? You know, I think it's the personal relationships I've developed at work. And once, you know, even those, when those colleagues are no longer there, the, those relationships stick. Mm. Um, you know, I don't think 20 years ago I would have thought or imagined that, but it makes sense. You know, you're working with individuals and you surround yourselves with great people and you want those to continue. So yeah. I think that is surprising. Yeah, I, that's generally true, but contact center people tend to really like people. They do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Agree. What's most surprised you in life? Most in life is time, how fast time goes. It's crazy. Yeah. Right? It's, you know, days go by slow, but years seem to go by fast. And, you know, I don't, I don't, know, if, I don't know if I like that. But yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. I have no choice, but it's going by <laughs> way too fast. Well, absolutely. I uh, was 25, like a minute ago. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like when I got here, I was 25. <laughs> uh, right. So here's the, you know, the question. On the soundtrack of your life, one track, one song that's got to be on there. It would be from the 80s, because that's my era. Oh. It would probably be something from Eurasia, maybe Duran Duran, something like that. Wow, okay. Maybe throw in, if you know, my mom's not listening, something from like Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Or something. <laughs> sure, of course. Of course, if your mom's not listening. <laughs> I like how Eurasia is in there, by the way. Oh, they're fantastic. You know, because like Duran Duran, sure, we get it. And Frankie Goes to Hollywood, they, they were very huge for a minute. A minute. Right. Your rays are still around. Are they touring still? Yeah. Well, I, I saw them a couple years ago, and they're fantastic. Yeah. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Allison. Thanks so much, sir. And there you have Jeff Allison. I've always enjoyed people, which is why the Contact Center has worked so well. My entire life has literally been in a call center, says Jeff Allison. In front of his peers, very much appreciate him doing uh, the interview. Very much appreciate his time. Very much appreciate you and yours. Stay tuned.